This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. Facebook undoubtedly has some of the top designers in the world working under one roof. But what does it actually take to be a designer there? I talked to product designer Nicholas Inzuki to find out. At Facebook, we look for designers that are very holistic or generalist in their skill set. So I think what it takes to be successful is to not just obsess about pixels and execute um, prototypes that are exactly the spec, but also to be able to think fluently across things like uh, research, user needs, uh, strategy, and engineering to make the whole product come together. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. This week, 4 Winds Interactive is looking for an art director in Denver, Colorado. We also have job listings from indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts so when there are new positions added to the job board, you'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, let's talk about our sponsors, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. Whether you're into design, coding, music, or art, Glitch is the right tool for you. You can start from scratch or remix any of the available projects that you see and make them your own. And if you get stuck on something, just raise your hand and get help from the Glitch community. Get started on making something awesome today at Glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Did you know that the number one email marketing priority is personalization? I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. You only want to hear from the people and the businesses that you like. And MailChimp helps make that happen with their robust campaign builder and a host of helpful automations. It's email marketing with a personal touch. Sign up at MailChimp.com today for a free account. MailChimp. Send better email. Now for this week's interview, we're talking to the incomparable Cheryl D. Miller, author, writer, visual artist, corporate designer, and theologian. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. Maurice, thank you for having me. And my name is Cheryl Miller, and I also use the the handle of C.D. Holmes Miller, and I am a corporate designer, I am a clergy theologian, and I am an author writer. And uh, I've been involved doing this, these disciplines, my whole life. And for people, I think, that have been following Revision Path probably at least since maybe 2015, I'm sure have heard of your name because I've referenced your work so many times, in particular your thesis your 1985 thesis from Pratt Institute, which I do want to talk about, but I want to go back kind of to the beginning before Pratt Institute, before kind of your work as a designer. Tell me what it was like for you growing up as a child. Okay. First off, and and I'm sure you're going to ask me about this again, further into the interview. My memoir is pretty much captures all of that dynamic beginning, which is extremely integral into how I resolved into a visual artist. 
and my background. I'm originally from the Mid-Atlantic. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. And uniquely, I'm a baby boomer, so I am, I am, I grew through pre-civil rights and post-civil rights era. I am multiracial, I'm mixed race, and, but it was during a time when I could not identify to my, my family's uh, ethnicity and race. And so I was raised African-American. So out of four grandparents, I have one of each race. I know that's very unique, and it was unique, you know, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So that became a part of my personal dilemma. And, and so growing up, just my physiology, my appearance in an urban environment was the beginning of the challenge. I'm white and Af- African-American and Filipino. And my father was uh, an affluent community black politician, had great aspiration, and it was not the time or place to celebrate his mixed family and his decisions of culturally and how racially to marry and raise family. And the best thing to do was just for us to be a part of the black community and to be raised African-American. And so we kind of resonated into the culture of my African-American paternal grandmother. The influence of the Danish West Indians, West Indies and the Caribbean is rich. I, I do claim that I'm a native Virgin Islander. My maternal family is all from the Virgin Islands and they're indigenous uh, Danish Creole. My mother is all physically, all totally physically Filipino and all culturally West Indian and specifically the culture from the Danish West Indies. So I had this incredible richness of race and culture that when I was growing up, I couldn't self-identify with any of it other than to be, my father just raised us African-American. And when I got a chance to go to the islands, I was West Indian, but it all didn't, it was an anomaly. And so with that, there were difficulties and challenges growing up as a young teen and much of my solitary space and not being included because I was unique is what put me in the arms of solitaire space that fostered the development of as an artist. My godmother was a painter. I was inspired by her, and she gave me my first set of paints and oil paints and, and canvas. I started winning my first, so unique is a story and a show all by itself. I won my first award at 10 years old, and there was never a doubt in my mind that I would I would become just who I am today. No, I had no doubt at all. And what happened, how it began to actualize after the civil rights movement, all of the Ivy League schools predominantly began to open up out of New England and points north, south, east and west to the African-American community. And they came down into metropolis and into urban areas to recruit uh, primarily African-American kids and um, Hispanic kids, mostly Puerto Ricans. And I say that because you have to put the time frame on it. The variety of the Latino and Hispanic community wasn't as prevalent as it is now. And what was prevalent was on the African-American community and the Puerto Rican community out in New York. So they came down, the schools came down, all of them came down to get us right after Martin Luther King died and the civil rights Movement kind of closed out and transitioned in late 69. It's this time I'm, um, I'm applying for college. And Rhode Island School of Design recruited me. And I had focused all the way from my first award at 10 years old into art and continuing to wear, win city awards and studying in high school. And I was one of the um, first to be recruited out of Washington from D.C. public schools having studied art up and out after the civil rights into New England and uh, RISD. That's how I got up out of the South, mid-Atlantic, into um, New York and points north, south, east, and west where we find the design community. That's how I, got, how I got going. And the burden that I carried was the inability to proclaim, live out, self-identify, uh, being mixed race and multicultural are the things that 
I can't say it's every day now, but it's pretty much every day. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was just chuckling with my with my brother. I've been on college campuses touring and things with with my and visiting in college life with my young adult kids, and I have to laugh. I recently told my brother, I wish we were going to college now. They'd have a place for us. They call us they call us havesies, and I, I, we would be havesies plus or hoppers. Now there's, you know, I can have a community. <laughs> I didn't have a community when I was a kid. So you take all of that obstacle of being able to be fully all of who you are and then being wedged into completely being African-American with an aspiration to some kind of eclectic career of high-end design. That's kind of how it was. And I'm, I'm proud to say I survived, <laughs> but it was challenging to say the least emotionally. But I have had the privilege to sit and document it and all the mysteries to my Filipino family. And there were just so many mysteries and cloudedness through my youth because we just could not bring forward. And much of it was because it was illegal. How about that? 1967 is when the laws changed about marriage and racial mixing and blending and so forth. And uh, if you know the loving story, et cetera, et cetera. So we live covertly. I found creative space in areas and times of isolation. And that's where I birthed, well, I got to do something with this solitaire space. Let me be an artist. That's it. I didn't even sort of consider, I guess, that legality portion of it. I know when I've talked to people in the past on the show, um, and we talk about, you know, kind of design education and how people of color are sort of starting way behind as it relates to even going to to design schools and things like that. I didn't even consider that the legality portion of how the Civil Rights Act kind of changed all of that. Yeah, it, it was the Marriage Act is basically, you know, I got caught up in that. And so not that we were, we just lived covertly. It wasn't something that we pronounced mm-hmm. that we were earnestly mixed race, multiracial, and multi-ethnic, multicultural, whichever combination of buzzword, you know, we were not all pure African-American. I mean, you know, physically, culturally, and there was no place. It was very binary, monochromatic. There was nothing, you were either white or black. And so our complexity had no place other than we're going to be African-American. We're going to celebrate that. We're going to live that. And culturally, it's my strongest right arm. And I am always a black woman, but I also am all these other things that I have the opportunity to talk about. But I couldn't live like that then, though it was all in my all in the four walls of my home. That's what happened in my home. But it was not something that I could bring out into the public. And that had a lot to do with the timing of the legal and civil rights issues of the time. And my father was a man of great aspiration who had gotten a platform. He wanted to be mayor of Washington, D.C. and died prematurely. And the work that he was doing pretty much was uh, the preface work for what Marion Barry did. Uh, But my father was behind the scenes, Negro politician interfacing with the White House and the Labor Department to ensure manpower initiatives into urban communities. And he died my first year I was in RISD. And that also became a part of my sense of legacy that my father had taught me really how to succeed, why to succeed, and the call to leave legacy and live your life for others. And I felt the first thing that I needed to do was to succeed at what he had invested in me. And I had a responsibility that if he believed in me with this eclectic career, I didn't want to waste his money. His provision he left me so that I could go to college and everything else, I wasn't going to squander it. And he was a great man, and my parents were great people, and they lived boldly and courageously during this time. And I felt I had a responsibility to multiply it. So I could have gotten lost in it, Maurice. I really could have gotten lost in it. But the God in me said, I made you for such a time as this. Keep journeying until you get to it. And now you finished out your undergrad career at MICA, is that right? Yeah, it was really, really unfortunate. My dad passed away three weeks before I was to return to Providence. And both of the schools got together, and MICA received me. I needed to go back home to be near my mom, but I wasn't giving up art. Mm -hmm. So the closest I could get to her was MICA. And they made a few phone calls, admissions, dean to dean. And it was unfortunate, 
but I, I left Providence to be near my family and the closest that I could get to my family and continue my aspiration was Baltimore. So I went to school during the week and I was in Washington every weekend helping my mother with the estate and, and mourn and try to get her life back together. You know, she's Filipino Creole, West Indian woman dropped down into Washington, D.C. with two Negro children. I hope she appreciated that I came back. So I, 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 I know she did. My, my brother was a young teen and I came back home to be with my family and Micah was the best win-win for me, I could continue my art career and, and be with my family. Very unfortunate, but this is what life happens, but you got to keep going and keep going on your path. So the vision was keep studying art and you can drive 45 minutes from Baltimore to Washington to be with your family, you know, on the weekend and if there's any emergency. So that's how I, I got rerouted, like GPS, uh, I got rerouted and I did my work at MICA. What was it like for you during that time as a student at MICA? I mean, outside of what you just mentioned with, with what happened with your family, what was it like for you as a student? I think in a recent interview with Michelle Washington, who was one of my peers from back in the day in New York, and she's still very vibrant as a design historian and culturist and writer. In a recent interview, she reminded me of the challenges that I met because she'd been with me and had interviewed me on several occasions. And she reminded me of one of my issues that was pretty pivotal. I was competitive, I believe, in design school, but I could never get critiques. So when I say competitive, the work looked as it should at that age and at that place of design maturity but I could never get critiques. So in other words, I would, it's a process. You do your projects, you put up your assignments, there's critical reflection, there is peer reflection and critique, teacher critique, critiques. I couldn't get any critiques. So where I felt okay in myself being in the community, I didn't feel any racial backlash. I'm, I'm still an anomaly physically, so I'm sure there was a part of the community that didn't know what I was. I didn't have any issue with my physicality or, you know, what are you? Or if I was recognized as a black woman or mystery race or anything, nothing like that made me feel excluded. But where it came out was in the review and where am I as a designer process? And how would that happen? I don't know whether blatantly or not blatantly, people would skip over my work. No one would talk about it. Professors would, if everything is lined up on the wall or on the table or, you know, visiting professors or classes or things would come in. If you got 10, 15 projects, 14 out of the 15 projects would get a critique. And yours wasn't getting a critique. I had, and I had no feedback. Huh. I couldn't tell anything. I was learning and growing in a vacuum without knowing, am I hitting the mark? Am I missing it? And, you know, what's going on here? So after a while, I kind of processed, I'm being boxed out. And I took a course of action. My course of action was I would come in 30 to 45 minutes prior to class and set my work up and then leave out, and then come in with the rest of the class. So I could not be identified with the work that was being presented. Once I separated myself and went into my own covert mission so I could get critiques, <laughs> then I found out where I was in the scheme of things, and then people started telling me I was a good designer. So it wasn't blatant. It was covert. I didn't feel it in the sense of community. Like, I could go to as many lectures you know, coffee houses were big back then. You know, I had friends. We went to apartments together. And, you know, I didn't have any particular issue with being excluded like that. But I sure enough couldn't get any design reflection on what I was doing until I came up with this tactic. Get your work in so no one can see who you are attached mm -hmm. to what piece. And that's when I began to see who I was, where I was going, what was right, what was wrong. And that's when I got information. 
And unfortunately, I traveled away, away, um, feeling that I was in genuine space. But I think these things were inherent. And I don't think that anybody meant it, but I don't think that anybody knew what to do with me either. So, you know, physically, I'm an anomaly and I'm there. And so what do we do with that? And when we don't know what to do with that, we don't do anything. So for whatever it was and whatever it took, my solution was detach myself from the work so that I can see what the work is doing. And then I got a good, clear signal of what to do and where to go and definitely to keep going. That there wasn't a thing in terms of the trajectory of how you develop as a designer. There wasn't anything, there wasn't any signal to tell me, keep going. How about that? So talk about how you ended up then at Pratt. I mean, it sounds like, you know, you sort of had this internal will to succeed and certainly to leave a legacy while you were at MICA. Is that what drove you to then attend Pratt Institute? No. <laughs> no, not okay. at all. Okay. It, the, sense of le- the sense of legacy didn't happen until I got to Pratt. And the sense of destiny, though, I've always had. Okay, there's a, there's a difference. Legacy is, I have a motto, living your life is your story. Living your life for others is leaving a legacy. And that's what we should all do, is not only live your story, but leave a legacy. So the legacy leaving happened at Pratt. The destiny fulfilling, I've always had that. In other words, I got to walk in this. I was gifted at this. I'm called to this. And no matter what happens, I got to do this, like it or not. You know, if, if I'm out of sync, culturally, time-wise, era, whatever, it's the only thing that's been given to me to prosper. So, I, I, yes, destiny from the time I could pick up a paintbrush. I used to draw cartoons and when I was three years old, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, <laughs> you know, in front of the TV set. I've been doing this my whole life, and I was given a gift. And I recognize that. So I've always walked in destiny. And through my guy, I was walking destiny. Through Pratt, I found the legacy piece. And how I got into Pratt is why I found myself in New York is I had completed a full broadcast design career in Washington, D.C. I worked for three of the local networks. And the latter was, was a great opportunity. So I worked for one of my great anecdotes, Mr. Cherry, is... I started in broadcast design. I was a little junior art director, graphic designer type at WTOP Post Newswick Channel 9 after I graduated from MICA. And this is the period of time when Gail King was a production assistant and Oprah was in Baltimore. We all were doing TV. You know, I was in the back doing TV art cards, okay, while Gail King was a production assistant. And we all were working for Post Newsweek in Washington, D.C. So this is out of that era. And I completed that entire broadcast design career out of Washington, D.C. I resolved right before leaving, I was on the startup. I've always been blessed to be on the startup of things and and the development of initiatives and organizations. And my first um, provenness and giftedness of that as I was on the startup team for the development of Howard University's PBS station, WHMM. Then it was WHMM Channel 32. And I had the great privilege of designing their corporate identity and putting in an art department, promotions department. And my husband, Samuel Casting, was completing his MBA at American University and with his career um, was offered a New York strategic planning job uh, for one of the uh, major corporations. And his job moved us to New York City. And I found I found my way in Design Mecca and he was Basically, he was primary steps of his career. We moved to New York, and he said, Cheryl, I got to go to work, find an apartment, and go find what you're going to (laughs) do. And so I was a corporate wife, and I landed in New York City. And I said, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to be in New York, so why don't I go to school? And that's what I did. I applied to Pratt, and I asked them if they would be kind enough to consider my 10 years of broadcast design toward my graduate degree. They gave me half of my degree uh, based on professional experience and told me that I had to earn the rest of the way. So in earning the rest of the way, I focused on design management classes. I focused on corporate communication, senior design type 
I focused on annual reports and corporate work. I had given my whole life to broadcast design, so I didn't need to do any more of that media broadcast, set design, that kind of um, uh, three-by-four three by visual space. So I, I labored down into print and uh, corporate design and design management, and then I was challenged. Upon graduation, I was challenged. So I earned half of the degree hard work and presented had evaluated half of the degree based on um, my professional status. And I finished a three-year program in a year and a half. And when it came down to write a thesis, my design chair, who at the time he's passed away now, his name is um, Eitan Manassi, uh, he challenged me and he said, Ms. Miller, I'm sorry to report, we're not going to let you do a design project and to complete that will be too easy for you. And I said, really? I can't do a design project thesis? And he said, no. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he says, I need you to make a contribution to the industry. Now you go figure that out and go do your research and write your thesis and make a contribution to the design industry. And then you will have matriculated out of your master of science specializing in communication design. That's the only way you're going to get out, lady. <laughs> and that's the journey of this um, infamous practices that brings us to our current today conversations. It has, I did that. I did exactly what they, what they wanted me to do. Yeah. I can't believe it. And how it, took, how it took flight after that is yet another story. But that's how the work came to be and why it remains in everybody's life today, to which, you know, I'm really, really... There isn't a day that I'm not overwhelmed about, about that because I'm unearthed year after year after year to reflect on this work I did when I was a kid. I honored what Aton asked me to do, and I, I'm humbled by it, and I'm humbled that it's made a difference and it has been a contribution. But that's the story of it and how I tackled how I tackled it was I had, I had assessed a problem. I knew there was a problem. I got readers from cross-disciplines. And I would acknowledge my head reader is, uh, doc, was Dr. Leslie King Hammond, who I met. She was at the time dean of one of the deans at um, dean of graduate studies at MICA. I had known her. She became my academic mentor and coach. And we cross-referenced voices, sociology, history, psychology. She pushed me to research in areas that didn't have anything to do with art, had everything to do with race and culture language. I actually sat to read the thesis again over the weekend, over the holiday. And I'm like, oh my God, what in the world was I writing? I was, I even went in and I studied the bibliography, the things that I used to analyze design and its um, practitioners and even put forth the prescription. This is, I, this is what I think that each filter, if you will, of the design community from practitioners to employers to parents to individuals to academia. You know, there is a prescription of solution. And this is all this document. And I, I think the greatest thing that Dr. Hammond did was to push me to research out of my comfort zone, starting with her, making her my head reader. So she's always been my academic coach and mentor to this day. And I didn't have a design mentor ever. I ever. <laughs> it's unbelievable, but I had no one. And if there was anybody, there were two two big influence pieces that I had. One was for business, but really two for business, and one for ac academia. Dr. Hammond pushed me as a young woman to excellence, and so when I found myself. You know, you'll ask me about my theological training and career. When I found myself embracing scholarship, I realized that I had gifts for scholarship and research and critical thinking and answering problems to questions that haven't even arisen for thinking. And at this point, when I look back, I, I, I can claim now, after this whole journey, I'm a design futurist. And the reason that I say that I'm a design, I'm a corporate design futurist, because today, is what I saw 30 years ago. Not only am I today what I saw 30 years ago, 
But the community that I'm speaking to now is here. And I said back 30 years ago that we all would be here and that we would be tackling and facing this. And I gave the solution back there then also. <laughs> so, so it's this giftedness, plain giftedness, that I was allowed to see where we would be and be able to be graced with life to live it out. So that's how that thesis came to be. I was pushed to a place of leaving excellence and legacy and to solve an issue that I didn't even know would be trending today. And what do you say what that is? That's a God-given call and a place of preparation of life's blessing on anointing on it to answer a variety of appointments along the way to make sure that the problem of legacy that I identified must be solved. And that's our time now. I know that might be kind of ethereal in our listening, but you asked me, and these are my truths. I was pushed at a young woman to make a contribution. And here we are. And I'm humbled that I've been able to, to do that, leave that, and inspire everyone to help me finish the legacy walk by living it out. So what I, I want to sort of ask you about next is what was the industry like for you during that time after you graduated? I'm sort of skipping over the AIGA portions a bit. I'm really kind of more concerned about what was it like for you as a working designer right out of school? What was it like in New York City? It's real clear that I figured out a niche and a business template. And again, I could not get a seat at the Premier Studios. I was facing, I don't think, any racial exclusion. I don't. I just, you know, we work with people that we feel comfortable with. And I was an anomaly. And I did not feel any racial hindrance. I more felt like an anomaly. Like, what is this? And we don't have to deal with this because we have so many to pick from in New York. So where I would get portfolio reviews and invitations to interview for jobs, and I, I, all of the top studios, you know, I knocked on the doors, portfolio reviews. I never felt any racial exclusion. I more felt like, well, what are we going to do with this? And we don't need to do anything with it because we have so many others to pick from. Because this is New York City. So it pushed me quickly into starting my own business. And that is where I became competitive because I had a very unique business model at a very unique time in New York City business for business for women and affirmative action. I stepped on the pathway of initiatives for women in business, New York supported corporate community and state government community type initiatives for, for women and minorities in business. And I stepped onto the platform of open door for minorities in business and women. And I started the firm. And the firm was very unique. And so, uh, you know, from 1984 to I dissolved it in 2000, I was competitive. So, so that's how I solved it. I opened up my own place at a time when there was a lot of support for women and minorities in business. And I, I was able to check the box for both. I'm a minority and I was a woman and there was corporate sponsorship initiatives, federal and government kind of programs. And I maximized it. I was ready for those, to embrace those opportunities and had done enough of my preface work to see that I wasn't going to get anywhere with any premier studios in New York. Mm. And so being able to kind of carve out that niche is what really set you up for success. I know that, you know, just from us talking, Uh, Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, it intersect right here because the niche was the business template, which was extremely unique. It wasn't just the open door for minorities and women. It's when that door opened, what happened after Mm -hmm. that made me successful. Okay. And I say that humbly. It was a unique business template. And quickly, I'll tell you what that was. That open door for women in business and minorities in business opened into Fortune 1000 companies who were prepared to embrace and support those initiatives. So my first step on the pathway was to get Fortune on 6th Avenue, actually Fortune 100 work. Once I competed 
and I could deliver, then the national African-American organizations that respectively those Fortune 100 companies supported paid me as an in-kind service, sent me over to the top national offices of United Negro College Fund, the Urban League, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the National Black Caucus Foundation, and the likes thereof on a national level. I was sent, paid by a corporation, sent to an organization to do corporate communications. So I began, that was the niche. That was the niche that nobody else was embracing. Mm -hmm. That once that door opened on for corporate work and I could compete, and specifically in an area of corporate communications. See, this is the time in the era of segmented marketing, and advertising was big. There was some, okay, this is the era of um, PepsiCo and McDonald's, all of a sudden introduced other faces, Burger King and Coca-Cola and PepsiCo and the like, Uniworld and Mingo Jones and all of these, they were doing advertising. There was a sales promotion lane. So it was an advertising lane, a sales promotion lane, and I dared to do high-end corporate communications, annual reports, and such. So I would get the corporate work. Once I was competitive, they paid me as an in-kind service, sponsored me to go over to the national organizations to do the same work. And that was the niche. One corporate client, in most cases, 90% of the time, made two clients. Hmm. One, the Fortune 5, 100 to 500 predominantly, and then I swung over and did national African-American work, but selling all the same product, corporate communications. And that was the niche. That was the ticket, and that was the portfolio. High-end corporate communications for national African-American corporations, which were sponsored by my major clients who were Fortune 100s. That's what happened, sir. Wow. And what happened is I dared to take the thesis. And I walked it over to Print Magazine in 1987 after I graduated. And it must have been 90. It took, I think it took like nine months to do the article. So, and I graduated in 85. So between 85 and 86, I walked over to Print Magazine. I'll never forget it. I put the thesis in a brown envelope with a yellow sticky. And I wrote Martin Fox. And I said, Print Magazine, I would like to turn my thesis into a magazine feature article. By the time I walked from print magazine offices back to my studio, they called me, has, had assigned me Tim, Tom, Tom Goss as my editor, wrote me a letter, and promised me a check. Mm-hmm. And the minute the article was published, somebody at AIGA said, go get that woman. And the minute it was published, my voice, my legacy voice, my advocacy voice, the studio, which was already in motion with this template, fast forwarded onto a visible conversation. And we're here today. That's it. That's how it happened. I'm just walking out destiny and crazy enough to ask questions <laughs> and say, I'm coming. Can I come? And, I, and then the work was so beautiful. I will admit, humbly I submit, you know, I, I couldn't compete if the firm didn't do beautiful work. And we started winning awards. It wasn't anything racial about it. I would submit jobs. I mean, I would submit our projects. And we won awards. And then the visibility, I got privileged. I was called to be a judge. And it just did what we all want our work to do. I was just blessed in it. And walking out destiny. All the way from that story when I told you, you know, I was three years old, coloring Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck in front of of, uh, uh, the Mickey Mouse Club show. How about that? (laughs) I want to still kind of go forward here a little bit. You did your your design work throughout the 80s, throughout the 90s, and then eventually life kind of turned for you where you ended up being called to the clergy. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's real simple. I did all that heavy lifting in my young adult life. I did all of that work, the studio, uh, just all of it, all of it. And I I was about 38, coming on to 40-ish, and a publication for Union Theological took me up to the seminary. I designed publications, a publication, and I got involved with the seminary. And long story short, I was getting older. My husband and I didn't have a family. I needed 
I, my biological clock and the journey was kind of, it's like, you, lady, design and all this that you're doing is all well and good. Stop and have a family and take some sabbatical time. And so the sabbatical time from all of this journey, design journey, that was a lot of lifting for a kid. You know, I just gave you a story. My father died in it. And it's a lot of lifting and a lot of going through obstacles and a lot of just a, a lot of it. And by the time I was 38, you know, I had my husband, but I had no family and I'm, I'm exhausted. And I was faced with I was faced with technology changing, having to sign new leases on Apple computers. This is 1992. And if you if you think about digital and electronic life, the Kendall was announced in 1997. I'm looking at 1992. And I said, I'm tired. And I need to make a family. And I'm going to take that quiet time and I'm going to do some theological work. I was invited to study. I was invited to go to seminary. I was invited to go to grad school again. So I, I slowed the studio down. I took, kept premier clients. And so from the time I entered into seminary until the time my son appeared, he arrived, I slowed down the firm, but I didn't dissolve it. My son was two years old and I had finished seminary. Design kept calling me and I kept doing as many projects as I could do. But 2000, I said, I have to stop. I have to stop, put it on hold. And I started doing the theological work and raising my family. And we hence moved out of the city and I was raising children and I've uh, pastored two churches and taking care. I'm always a corporate wife, taking care of my family and my husband and just paused it. And all of the boxes and everything from that life, when we got to Connecticut, my husband said, um, we're going to move in this again, aren't we? And I said, well, until I figure out where it's going, it's got to keep going with me. So the whole journey, that's, and I was kind enough, uh, Lee Daniels, who's a journalist, not the casting director, he was one of my clients, corporate communications for the National Urban League. He wrote a beautiful article. He said, Cheryl, your clients, you made such an impact. Let me do an article on how you segue to raise your family and to pastor. And so there's a beautiful article written in 1998, I believe, because my son is featured in it and he's three months old, where it talks about my career and how it segued to me raising my family. And uh, I had babies. And so we paused. And all of it was in 50 boxes in my basement. That's how it happened. And that's how I saved everything. And it was all stored in my basement. So speaking of all these boxes, let's talk about your collection that's now at, at Stanford University. How'd that come about? <laughs> Everybody's looking for the thesis. Let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Everybody keeps looking for the thesis. And this, this gentleman, Michael Grant, is a John Knight scholar at Stanford University. And in the beginning of winter, he went on a search to try to find the thesis. And he knew it was there from writings and articles and things over the course of 30 years. He wanted it. And he went to the library and asked the librarian to find it. And she subsequently called uh, Pratt. She found it. She found me. And when she found me, she found the thesis, wanted it for the Stanford repository, and discovered I had the boxes in my basement and she asked me for them. Hmm. And now it is the Cheryl Miller collection, Cheryl D. Miller collection at Stanford university and special collections servicing research for four, if not five disciplines, communications and journalism, anthropology, feminist studies, design and history, political science history. It's not only design. It was what I was publishing for people. My portfolio is one big history book. So it annotates out to a lot of discussion and a lot of research. So someone came looking for that research, and then the library found it. I mean, the, someone came looking for the thesis, the librarian found it, found me, and the boxes in my basement. And we're going to have okay. links in the show notes where people can not only view the video of all of this, but see all of the pictures of the boxes and everything, read the press release. I really want people to kind of see that whole experience and how it came about. 
Yeah, and there's a depth. I mean, it's a radio show all by itself, what's in the collection. But briefly, it's in four categories. First off, all of the writings. So, you know, I wrote the thesis, articles, um, when I was active, all my industry, all of my industry writings are there. And the, the research, the original manuscripts, the original interviews, cassette interviews, you name it, anything that I had, the backstory for everything that's been published from the thesis through trade articles, everything that I did, all of the research, the interviews, transcribed, handwritten manuscripts, the recordings. So that's in the collection. The business model for the studio, everything I ever wrote. Can you believe that? Everything, every business letter. My secretary at the time used to think I was crazy. <laughs> she would say, Ms. Miller, do I? I said, yes, you have to save everything. We had a floppy disk of all business letters, and she would make a hard copy of every business letter. My bylaws, everybody wanted my bylaws, everybody wanted my business plan, all of my business letters, my process for sales, through completion, contracts, proposals, the business backstory to the firm is there. All of the portfolio pieces, every job that I've done from 1974 to 2000 is in the job jackets, and the job jackets contained client notes, thumbnails, layouts, sketches, typography, back in the day, galley edits and proofing, all the way through finished pieces. Every piece I had, I would buy, because I was in business, I would buy anywhere from 250 to 1,000 copies of everything I produced because I was selling. So my basement was full of samples, a sample of all of this work. Okay, and primary pieces before I got to New York City. So all of the work from 1974 to 1982 before I get in all of my portfolios, my portfolios from high school, the, the one that I got into RISD with, the one I graduated from MICA with, all of all my senior projects, everything all the way from high school, my entire portfolio. Okay, so that went the studio work and all those notes, the samples for all of that. Okay, so. The whole how-to is the collection, plus a variety of interesting bio letters and all of the research for my memoir. Everything I've ever done, <laughs> the backstory to the research to the final pieces, it's unbelievable. It's, that's the only thing I can say. It's, uh, it's unbelievable that I saved everything. And so in my design thought process, a lot of my work was Swiss grid-based and so I showed one project in particular for Time, Inc., and one that they paid for for the United Negro College Fund. You could see everything, original paginations, original grids, photos. Oh, the photo collection is incredible. We're with two premier corporate photographers, Ed Eckstein and John Penderhughes. They were always so excited about doing books for me. I never worked with contact sheets. They sent me black and white prints, 8 by 10s in boxes per job. All of those outtake photos, incredible, incredible photographic gallery of their work. I got their permissions to include all of this. And all of that is in the collection. It is just each folder all by itself is a lecture, a class, or an exhibit. And that's the Cheryl Miller collection at Stanford. I'm honored that they came for this work that had been in my basement since I paused for my design career to to really raise my family. Let's switch gears here. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, before we started recording, I do have some questions that have come from our audience. So I hope you'll be open to maybe answering a little advice here. One person asks, uh, there's a lot of focus on designers under 30 within career development and diversity. What advice do you have for designers over 30 who want to continue to develop in this fast changing environment? I would say if you have the resource and the time to go back to grad school and to go back to grad school specifically for their variety of management, global studies for MBAs. There are just so many contemporary MBA type curriculum now in different kinds of schools. If you can swing going back and getting a business degree, it'll take you to the next level. The graphic design is a business to business service. Okay. So anything that will advance you into you know, the origins of where this is, you know, the closer you get to the power base and the closer you get to the money base, 
the place where you can make decision and impact is going to be continued education and exposure and internships that take you closer and closer to the place where organizational structure, you're a decision maker. And the only way to do that is to embrace business. So my answer is if you're 30 and you haven't been to grad school, go get an MBA and find one that's futuristic, that talks about D&I, okay, global business, D&I meaning diversity and inclusion, which further includes equity. So anything that takes you into the higher up the business chain, but exposes you to contemporary organizational trends and structure. So I say like a piano, you can play right hand, get your left hand going, and that's business, and you can take it further. All right. We've got another question here. This comes from Kojo Boateng. He's also been on our show before. He says, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself in both your 20s and in your 40s? Honestly, I don't mean I have to humbly submit I knew what to do. I don't have any advice for myself back then what I know now. I have a suggestion for me now with what I know. I want to say that again. I knew what to do. Don't ask me how I knew. So there isn't anything I know now that I didn't accomplish and do when I was 20 and 40. Okay. But what I have now, and remember now, I'm a futurist. What I have now is what I see now based on what I know. That what I have to say now is trending. And if I were younger now, if I were younger now, in today's time, the woman that I was then, now, I would be wealthy because I would know what to sell. I would be a competitive design practitioner in a world that is trending with diversity and inclusivity as a must. My time is now. So what I would say to him is, it's your time now. Now is the time. What I saw then is now. So my if is if I had my youth, I'd have the biggest, best firm in the globe. It would be my now moment. So I didn't miss knowing anything back there. What I don't have now is my youth. I don't have my verb now. I have my wisdom. And anybody who has the youth and is as I am now prepared, they would be wealthy in design because the time is now. I'm having my back to the future moment, Mr. Cherry. Who I am and what I am was made for this time. Now. So if the young adults know what I know and can listen to what I'm saying, they will be wealthy. And I don't mean wealthy in equity, wealthy in what can be done to solve what's trending now. So you almost have to listen to what I've said a couple of times because there's nothing now that I know that I would have used when I was 20 or 40, except my youth. If I had 20 and 40 now, I would be ready with what I know to deal with the opportunity that's trending this very moment as this broadcast is playing. Like it or not, the community needs diversity um, practitioners and those that can compete will be wealthy. And when I say wealthy, well-roundedness, mind, body, and soul. Who would you have been if you didn't become a designer? Nothing else. There's no what else. And you know how I know that? Let me tell you how I know that. I started from the moment I could walk and talk. I don't know anything else. And I've had a time, both of my kids are college aged. I double checked this. I really did. I did a real deep soul searching. And in getting two kids in college, I have been on college campuses up and down this East Coast from Maine to Virginia and West into every kind of school you can imagine. I've been on a college campus for two kids. And I sat in each one and wondered if, did I pick the right course of action? What would I study today? What would I have become? And I have listened and watched the information sessions Mm -hmm. to some of the best colleges on the East Coast. And not only was I sitting for listening for my kids, I've sat and I listened, Cheryl, if you had to start again, or Cheryl, did you make the right decision? What would you do today? Look at what you could do. Even looking at more work, if I had to start again, what would I do? Did I make the right decision? That's been my only doubt. Did I make my right decision when I was young? And I can tell you without question that that even that time of introspection 
of taking my kids to some of the most interesting college campuses from Maine to Richmond, Virginia, and west into the mountains of New York and Pennsylvania. There is not one course, discipline, or degree that I could have, would have, or will embrace other than what I've already done. I'm an artist. What keeps you motivated and inspired these days? Well, as my work with my kids and my family, I'm empty nesting. And the fact that this collection has left my hands but not my life, and the fact that you are my son in the design industry, and you keep sending people who are looking for me, and you keep, <laughs> you keep raising me up, I've stepped back on the platform to finish my work. Even if it's to inspire others to finish the work and live it out, live it out now. If you read the article that I wrote for print in 2016, they came to me, we did an update from the first one in 1987. Mm-hmm. My la- if you don't read anything, read the last few paragraphs. We'll link to that. Your time, is, your time is now, go. Whether people realize it or not, they're bowing to the fact that diversity is here and the globe is here and globalization has created a variety of people and cultures. Go. Finish my work, finish our work, go live, prosper, be wealthy in spirit, mind, and body with the whole assignment. That's it. Now, I know we we talked, you know, very early on learning more about your background and you mentioned your memoir, which of course is part of the collection, which people can go and check out. And purchase from you as well. I don't want to, I want to leave that plug out. What are the best things that you owe your parents? When you look back, even through your career, through your life, what do you owe them? I owe them the sense of empowerment, the sense of entitlement. I never, ever, ever, ever doubted that I am somebody Mm -hmm. and that I came for a reason a plan and a purpose, and that I've been completely empowered. And I have not the greatest personality, but I have the greatest character. And that's the difference. I know a lot of people have personality and have no character. So I have a very strong value system and character. I honor my mom with that. My mother gave me grace, and my mother gave me character. My mother gave me value, and my mother gave me live truthfully, and my mother gave me my beauty. I'm not, I'm a very, and I say that beauty in a gracious way. I have a very interesting look, and physically, fit my physiology, you can see when, what are you, Mrs. Miller, when I say that I'm of Filipino heritage, I claim my physiology when I go to the doctors, you know, because I'm mixed and I go to the doctors, they, you know, I have to claim something. I'm not a white woman. I'm not a Negro woman. I'm not a, an Indian woman, my Native American woman, a First Nations. I got to get all the language you have to have. <laughs> I'm a First Nations woman. Though I'm mixed with those things, my, my health, my physiology, my outwardness. It's clear that when I say out of the Asian brand, I'm Filipino. When I say that I'm Filipino, it's very clear. You look at me and say, oh, that's, you know, it's like, what are you? You know, like, oh, that's it. Okay. She gave me all of that, which is, gives me my grace. My father gave me empowerment. You know, he gave me power, personal power. He gave me strength and he gave me succeed at any cost, no hindrance. And you are who you are and you came to do it and do it. My father was filled up a room. He was very against all odds and his obstacles. Unfortunately, he he passed away early, but he left empowerment and self-love to me. So you put the two together and that's Cheryl Miller. Where do you see yourself now in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? The collection is out there. What sort of work do you want to be doing? Well, I have to, I, it's finding me. And I am receiving I'm embracing everything that's coming to me. At some point in life, water flows in its direction, and I'm being led. I did not expect any of this. I didn't know. I knew it was coming, but and I always was prepared, mm-hmm. but I didn't know how. So 
I'm being invited to sit at a bigger table now, and I'm being appreciated. I don't like terms of acknowledgement and honored and all of that. I'm being appreciated for this legacy work. And so those areas where people want to appreciate me, those areas that want to hear from me, those areas that are asking me, and what does that look like? That looks like the kinds of things that designers grow up, professional designers grow up and do. Teach, lecture, inspire, speak, write, show up on a campus, be on a campus, be on a board, do this, do that, to keep inspiration for excellence wherever we find ourselves in our lives. Be excellent. My father said to me, Cheryl, I don't really care what you come up with. This art plan of yours, it's a little lofty. I'll support it. I'll pay for it. But he looked at me and said, if you're going to do it, then be the best at it. And I, 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 I obeyed him. And here we are. So where it leads me, I'm going to follow. What am I doing next? It's leading me, and I'm following. And I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes. Because anybody who will want me is now inclusive. Because I wasn't always wanted. So people that genuinely want me, I want to be where I'm wanted. And that's diversity, equity, and inclusivity. People want me because I'm diverse. People want me because I'm unique. People want me to be included. It's the first time in my life I'm being received without obstacle or hindrance. It's my time, too, just to say, Cheryl, can you come? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> it couldn't be easier than that, but my God, Mr. Cherry, at some point it's got to be easy because it's been a rough side of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> at some point the ship's got to the ship's got to it's got to land somewhere. I've been sailing out here for a while, sir. <laughs> I'm going where design journey leads me. It's asking for me. So we go. So if anybody's listening, wants me to come, ask me, I'll come. <laughs> That's really, it's really that simple. It couldn't, it couldn't be easier. Sounds good. Well, like I you know, have said before, we're going to have links in the show notes to, you know, your collection, to your print articles, to your book, et cetera. But where can people find out more about, you online. Do you have a, a website you want to uh, let the people know about? Well, you know, I have a, a this is all happening so much. There's um, a saying that goes the shoemaker's kids doesn't have shoes. Mm -hmm. So until one of you guys want to call me and help me get my website current <laughs> and my, I have a Facebook page. I have a cdhomesmiller.com which is primarily you can read about the book. The name of the book is Black Coral a Daughter's Apology to Her Asian Island Mother. You can get that. Uh, I thank God I've got fabulous re reviews. Amazon reviews are stars five and four, and they are really over-the-top reviews, and they weren't solicited. They're just people reading and thinking it, like they say in the church, not robbery, to go back and leave a review. So you can find that on Amazon. It's on. You can download it right away, it's the, or you can get a hard copy. And if anywhere that you find me out there on the circuit, you know, I'll, I'll sign a book. So it's there, Black Coral by C.D. Holmes Miller, and the best place is Amazon, and that's paperback or Kindle. I've got a web page. I've got a Facebook page, C.D. Holmes Miller. It's about the book. It's not current unless one of you guys want to come by and help me with that. But I'll tell you what's current. That's that. This this is a whole other show in and of itself. But if you really want to find me, it's Instagram.com slash Bishop C.D. Miller. And you can see my transformation to the ketogenic diet that works with my gene pool. It really does. And I'm with you guys. I'm just Gerald D. Miller, Stanford Collection. You know, every piece of what I am is out there now to sharing because I believe that I've been wealthy in Christ, which means spirit, mind, and body, I'm whole. And that's what this journey has brought me to. And if I can share that and help somebody along my way, then, Mr. Cherry, I'm really, really blessed. I'm good. Peace by the river. Well, that sounds like a good place to end off here. Well, Cheryl Miller, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your your journey. And I know that there were parts of it that we skipped. I know there's a lot of information out there about you, and we'll link to that in the show notes. But I'm really grateful to, one, finally get a chance to have you on the show, but two, to really kind of talk about what it is about your background that has gotten you to where you are today. Certainly, I think one thing with Revision Path is that we're trying to enable people to 
sort of be design futurists in and of themselves in a way, like by being able to see these people that look like them in this industry, it, it will hopefully give them the the knowledge and the motivation to do the same thing. And it's really been evident from your story that you've had uh, this this tremendous amount of foresight from a young age to now to not only know exactly what it is you're doing, but to document it for future generations to 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 know about it too. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yes, and thank you. And it was great um, finally shaking your hand and seeing you and giving you a big hug and kiss. And congratulations to you on persevering. And my greatest gift has been um, God touching me in persistence. And I see that those same giftings are on you. And I thank you. Thoughts of love are in. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Cheryl D. Miller and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Cheryl and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. But what's it like actually working there? Everything that Facebook designs is done at scale, so when you think about design critiques, metrics, and other factors, all of that stuff is a huge part of how they work. Sound interesting? Then learn more about Facebook design and what they do at facebook.com forward slash design. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. From games to art to music and hardware, Glitch is flexible enough to create some really powerful tools. You can even use it for work or to learn how to code. The possibilities are endless. So what will you create today? Get started at glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up today for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers, and they support the creative community as well. MailChimp really gives you the marketing tools to be yourself on a bigger stage. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, then please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute or two. It helps more people learn about the show here in the U.S. and internationally. It helps the show by bumping us up in the rankings there for design podcasts. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you're listening to this and you want to hear next week's episode early, then you should become our patron over at Patreon. You know, now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. Just $5 a month, you can get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.